Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we open this word. Dear Lord, we do pray that you will open our eyes and ears and heart and mind and understanding and teach us wonderful things out of your word. We commit this to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, everybody have the sheets that they need them. If not, our delivery boy will pass these out among you. He has the spiritual gift of ushering and has an opportunity to put that into practice, and he's quite happy to be able to do so. We're going to go through some things in just a moment. Uh, you're, we're going to be in uh, different chapters of the Bible. If you want to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 is where we'll start in just one bit. And you're welcome. Franz would always use the table of contents in the classes. We'd say turn to Genesis, and Franz would have to look up in the table of contents where it was. So feel free to tonight. You will be in good company if you have to do that. And so this is, we have to go from place to place to place, just the nature of what we're doing uh, tomorrow will be a little bit more set in some of the places. And I need to kind of preface what we're saying by telling you a little bit more of, um, of a segment of life. I went through a period of time where God blessed everything that I set my hand to. I went through a period of time for about 10 years where nobody I knew died. If you go through that, if you go through a period of time like that, it's going to catch up with you eventually. But I went through a time where nobody died. I went through a time where God was just blessing. He was blessing the ministry. He was blessing family. He was just blessing. And we knew it was God blessing. It wasn't something that we took for granted or I don't even think took credit for it. And our life changed. Uh, we had had two kids already. Uh, my wife came in with a report that we had identical twin girls that she was going to give birth to. And we were very thrilled about this. And then... In the sovereignty of God, uh, he saw fit for those twin girls to go home and live with him. And they, uh, they died at birth uh, shortly thereafter. I don't know the exact uh, moment. I turned down the heart monitors. We did not want to have the beeping going off type deal. You come out different when your kids die. You come out different. There's something unnatural to that. Some of you in this room in all likelihood have had a child die. It doesn't matter if they're one minute born or 10 years old or 30 or 50. It just doesn't matter what the age frame. And when they're your children, there's just a, a deep sense of loss. And uh, just having identical twin girls, I thought, would be a, a neat thing. We were going to be a family. That would make us a family of six. And so that part didn't work out uh, for us. And I knew that God carried us in the midst of this. Uh, it was the deepest grief that I had ever known uh, at that time anyway. It was the deepest grief. And never could break through God holding us up. And I knew that he was holding us up in the midst of this. Um, I always felt like before when I was a young pastor, I felt like I invaded somebody else's grief. That I didn't belong there. And it's not that I was the greatest griever ever. But ever since the twins died... Uh, there was a sense that I didn't feel out of place uh, anymore. It just kind of, I don't know, kind of a rite of passage. You don't sign up for things like that, but that, that was one of the side benefits that came out of it. Round two hit uh, about a year and a half to two years later. Well, I was still teaching at Washington Bible College. Uh, I lived in North Carolina about a five-hour drive. Uh, long. We were, the twins are going to make us a family of six. We couldn't afford a place in the Washington, D.C. area, so my brother built us a home in the Raleigh, North Carolina area, uh, a lot of times with the twins in mind. We signed a contract for a house on a Monday, and the twins died that Thursday of the same week. And we couldn't explain God's timing with this. Um, and so round two for us hit in the midst of... I had taught for a year at Washington Bible College. We had had our graduation ceremonies. I had gone to two or three graduation parties. And I ended up at Washington Bible College. They had like motel rooms that you could go stay in. And I had my little motel room there. And after graduation, it was just, just the security guard was there. I was there, maybe one or two other people. And I'm, I'm sitting there watching TV. They have a show called NBC Dateline. They probably don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Uh, it's a news show, news magazine show. And I'm watching this show uh, by myself. And I don't know if you've ever got sick when you're by yourself. 
you don't have a lot of people that you can ask uh, about how you're doing, or um, if you do, you're really in bad shape with this. But, you know, a lot of times you'll find out you're sick, somebody will look at you and say, do you feel okay? And when you're by yourself, it's just, uh, I found out it's a little bit different. And so I'm watching this show, NBC Dateline, and they're doing a show on the Ebola virus in Africa. And they're showing all these people having chills. And I was having these massive chills. And they were saying, it's got stomach problems. And I was having stomach problems with this, too. And everything that I'm watching with this, I mean, I just had this, uh, this terrible. I mean, just felt absolutely terrible. I got out of bed. I was right next to the infirmary. That was then the door next to mine. And I got out of bed and kind of crawled, literally crawled over to the infirmary next door. I got in there, I cut on the lights, having these chills, and I picked up a thermometer, and I put it in my mouth for about 7 to 10 seconds. And I pulled it out, and this is Fahrenheit, some of you will have to help me with the conversion part of this. But I pulled out the thermometer after about 7 seconds, and it was 103.8 fever Fahrenheit. It's a high fever, <laughs> where <laughs> whatever grade you use. Anybody kind of, any idea about what? Okay. All right, so my, with using Fahrenheit again on this, my initial thought was, I've got a bad thermometer. Of all the time to get there to the infirmary, I got the thermometer that doesn't work. Because I'd never had a 103.8 fever, and... Uh, I was scared I was going to bite the thermometer in half uh, with the chills that I was having. My teeth were smacking together. I was scared I was going to bite that in half. And, and so I got another thermometer, did the same thing, came out to about right about 104 Fahrenheit again. That's a real high fever for an adult. And then uh, they think, uh, nobody measured this, but they think it went up another two degrees or so, uh, which is real high for an adult uh, fever to have. And I... I I hallucinated, I think, I'm not sure. Um, I understood, I got up to the point, and here's what I want to find out when I go home to be with the Lord. I either got up to the point of, I knew where death was, and I knew that it's right here, it's right behind this door, coming in this long hallway, and when I, when I go home to be with the Lord, if you go home to be with the Lord, when I go home to be with the Lord, just kidding, when I go home to be with the Lord with us, that's one of the things that I want to find out. And he will either say, yes, you were at the point of death, but it was not your time to go. Or he's going to say, no, that was the fever. And that it was just, <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. Now, I knew where I was going. I knew why I was going in the sense that he saved me. It wasn't a fearful thing. It was just kind of, I didn't know if this was, if this was it. And so I called my wife the next night or so, and I said, I almost died, I think. I said, I'm not sure. I got some kind of food poisoning with a high fever, with a real, real high fever. And I said, I really do think I about died. For about two weeks, I would have these full body sweats where I would be talking to someone, and all of a sudden, it was like a faucet was cut on of water, and I could feel the, I mean, it's like just dripping down. I felt like a little, I had a shower on top of my head. And I'd be talking to people, and I could feel the sweat coming in. And, I, and they'd be looking at me like, what is happening to you? And I would be drenched and just have to go change my clothes. And that happened eight or nine times. And after two weeks, when my summer school class ended, I went back to North Carolina and it was a, a Friday afternoon, and Betsy had a flat tire, and I had changed the tire for her. I was up on the balls of my feet. And her, uh, her parents had rented, what could I say in place of a rider truck or U-Haul truck that they would have over here? Do you know as far as? Okay. Um, I rent, they had rented a truck uh, for furniture to be moved from one of their relatives' homes. And at that time, I was their relatively young son-in-law, and I had signed up to move furniture to them, with them. And I got out of bed the, the next day, my first day back, two weeks after the, the food poisoning or whatever it was. I never quite found out what it was. But I got out of, out of bed, and I barely could walk. 
it was with all the effort that I could do. I felt like I had a broken foot. It was all in the world that I could do to walk. And I had this bright red dot on the base of my right toe, kind of a scarlet bright dot, about the size of a BB. Do y'all have BBs over here? Okay, about the size of a BB on the base of my right toe. And you can't, I don't know about you, but I just couldn't call my in-laws and say, I've got a scarlet dot on my toe, and I'm not able to help you move furniture today. And so I helped them move furniture, lugged my leg up and down uh, the steps with this, and sweated profusely with that, but got done with it. And went to bed, got up the next day, and instead of a dot, it was a scarlet inch, about an inch on my big toe, my right foot, it was a scarlet inch of, of whatever it was. We went to a doctor's urgent care. They have that here or something similar. Doctor in a box. Uh, the emergency room. Okay, went to the emergency room for, not really with a hospital, just kind of an emergency room off to the side. Um, they call them doctor urgent, doctor's urgent care in America. And um, went there, and the doctor goes, wow, look at that. You have a red streak on your big toe. And I said, that's exactly right. And all that education is not wasted. I did have a, a, And he said, look at that. He said, I have, they check for spider bites. They check for Lyme disease. I don't know if you have Lyme disease over here. Check for all kinds of diseases related to that. Uh, gave me some antibiotics. Couldn't find anything in that regard. And uh, he said, if there's any change, come back the next day, and, and we'll see what we can do. So I got up the next day, which was a Monday, and it was a red streak going up inside. It had gone past my ankle, and it was working its way up my calf. And I went back to doctor's urgent care. They uh, sent me to the hospital immediately. They admitted me to the hospital. And I stayed in the hospital about a week. Um, and then my, my feet started swelling. They, they looked like cartoon character feet. My feet turned bluish black. They swelled like kind of grapefruit size. I, I looked, when I was in, in the hospital bed, I was thinking, if I had a pen, I could pop these things. Like you pop a balloon and just see what would happen with this. And as the swelling made its way up my body, it made it up both knees, it made it up both hips, it made it up both, it made it into my wrist, it made it into my right jawbone, it made it into one joint in the neck. And as, it, as the swelling would take place, the, the pain was just excruciating. It was like a broken bone, uh, just being broken over and over and over again. The nurse called me, or one time paged me in there, rang me or whatever it was, and she said, Mr. Harris, do you want something for pain? And I said, no thanks, I've got enough pain, I'd like something for comfort. <laughs> and they said, <laughs> they said, okay, we'll be in just a minute. And so... Uh, you know, they hooked me up to morphine or Demerol. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but, and for those of you who have any kind of medical background in here, my white blood cell count was not elevated. I thought it would be. And what they do a lot of times is a process of elimination for what you don't have. They'll do a test for this, and I'll come back, this is negative, they'll come back for this, this is negative. And in the process of elimination, they came back and they said, you have rheumatoid arthritis. And I had different doctors for this. And one doctor said, you've got the one in 5,000 case of rheumatoid arthritis. And another doctor told me, you've got the one in 50,000 case of rheumatoid arthritis. And you pick your own number with this. One doctor said, you've got the one in 500,000 case of rheumatoid arthritis. Now, you know how sick you have to be to be in a hospital in America nowadays? I was in the hospital for about a week with what turned out to be rheumatoid arthritis. By the time it settled down, it hit in the neighborhood of 70 to 80 joints uh, from my feet up to my jawbone and just kind of irrelevant. Whether it's 70 or whether it's 80 by that point, I hurt. It wasn't so much my feet hurt or my wrist hurt. I mean, I hurt from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. 
Now what has happened with this is that they have changed so much of their procedures with what they've done. Even like seven or eight years before they wouldn't have done this. Once they found out I wasn't going to die, they prepared my wife for it. They, they didn't know when I went into the hospital if I was going to live or if I wasn't. And so they tried to prepare Betsy as best they could that we don't know. They thought this might be some kind of meningitis type deal. They just weren't real sure at the start. That's why, again, to come back, the bacterial, it's not an infection. It's something else that's going on. And so once they found out that it was rheumatoid arthritis, they would come and get me out of bed and walk me up and down the hall. And the first time they got me out of bed, I'm thinking, you have got to be kidding. You, you want me to go walk up and down the hall and take my little morphine IV drip, take my little two inch steps. I was shriveled over, I can't, it was in my hips too. I can't mimic how it was. I was, I would go there, walk, and they said, if you do not, if you don't walk, your joints are going to freeze up and you will lose the use of them. You've probably seen women a lot of times with the fingers the way that it is. And so I'm very thankful that if I had to have this, that it was something that, you know, that I was, it, they just had changed so much, changed the procedure with this. And so when I, when I got out of the hospital, I was on disability for seven months. I went for about a year without wearing shoes. The first time I put on a shoe after a year, I about threw up uh, in the store. How do you like those shoes? Blah. I mean, just kind of. <laughs> it was so unusual feeling to my to my feet. And so, in the midst of this, and I had I had pain that I had never had that that level of pain. I don't know if it's the worst thing in the world to have, but it was, and it was quite painful. In the midst of this, I was quite confident that God knew what this was, knew that this was part of the path that he had for me. I was able, when I went out, when I got out of the hospital, I was highly motivated. I had to go to physical rehab. And when I went to physical rehab, I thought that they were going to fan my face, put warm towels on me, and feed me peeled grapes. And what they did instead, they said, we have to break these open, so to speak. You have to take the wrist and hold it down for 30 seconds and don't pass out. Don't hyperventilate. That's not good count. I mean, when they say that, don't pass out. Don't hyperventilate. And then you have to go back and do it the other way. And i tell you what, I did absolutely. I was a shiny star patient. I did everything in the world that they told me to do. Because I had young kids and I wanted to play with them. I wanted to... I didn't know what this stuff was or how often it was going to come back, but I just wanted to make sure that I could look at myself in the mirror and know that I didn't take any kind of shortcuts in regard to this. And then if you stay crippled, I'm not talking about paraplegic type or quadriplegic to crippled, but the, the functional use of the legs, if I still lost it, then I wanted to make sure that I wasn't lacking in anything that I had done. And so I would go up to actually the school that I ended up teaching, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, was less than a mile away. And I would go up there and I would walk around the campus. And who is this man shriveled up walking in these baby steps, crying the whole time? And that was me. And I have since, um, I've had four surgeries, including a hip replacement from arthritis damage. But before... Um, before the surgeries, I got to finish two marathons. Um, I was the, I ran the Richmond, Virginia marathon when I was 48 years old. I ran the San Diego marathon when I turned 30. I stood up straight from rheumatoid arthritis when I turned 40, and that was vastly harder. And I ran when I was 48 years old. I got to run by God's grace. I got to run. I was the happiest. I wanted to be the number one. 48-year-old rheumatoid arthritic runner in that race. I had to stop and massage my feet repeatedly. And by God's grace, I finished that race. Um, I had people praying for me the whole time. I, as one, I cried ahead of time. went off and just thanked God that I had an opportunity to do so, just to run like that. And um, so anyway, not talking about keeping up with the Kenyans or any kind of nonsense like that, just but I, just, I was able to... <laughs> I was able to finish the, the marathon twice. 
and uh, I have to wait till the resurrected body to do a run nowadays. So that that particular part of my life is over. But we have gone through two things with this. We have gone through the the death of the twins, and God held us up. And we've gone through the real bizarre case of rheumatoid arthritis, and God had held us up. And then I went through a period of time for the last, our whole time lasted three and a half years. I went through a time where all of a sudden that all the ministry opportunities that God had opened doors before just stopped. And not only stopped, they closed and closed tightly. And I could not give myself away. Nobody, I wasn't teaching at a place. I wasn't pastoring at a place. Do y'all have the word redneck over here? Do y'all know what that is? I mean, I would ask God, isn't there a redneck church somewhere that needs a pastor? Isn't there an inner city church somewhere that needs a pastor? And it was just part of what God had. You know, looking back on it, it, it was harder than the other part. And I think what God did was say, with the twins and with the arthritis, this is what it's like when I carry you. And just so you'll have a base of comparison, this is what it's like when I don't. And it was a big difference. It's not so much that the three and a half year period ended. There was just a time, and I understand biblically what took place now. In John chapter 15, Jesus says that whoever bears fruit, the father prunes in order that he bears more fruit. I don't know if you've been around things that are pruned. They look like they killed it, don't it? If you see something pruned... You look at us it, like what's left. I just uh, and I think what happened was the sense that God pruned, and I bucked and kicked and screamed a lot of the the last part of this. And there's more in the book. And just for the record, the book is not a money making deal. I don't get any kind of royalties out of this at all. All I'm go to scholarships or missions. I need to be able to. I wanted to be able to tell people you need to read the book without making it sound like I've got my lemonade store stand open for business and I'm ready to roll. And so this is not a money-making deal by any means uh, uh, whatsoever. But I ended up during this time that I got invited. I had resigned from Washington Bible College, and I got invited to speak in chapel there. And for the first time in my life, in the midst of the worst of the three-and-a-half-year period, I mean, the twins, when you go through stuff like that, it wears you down. And you go through arthritis like that, it, it just wears you down. And then when you're in, involved in a ministry and, and it's been fruitful and you know that God's been the one that has caused us to be fruitful, and then it just dries up. And it's like, what happened? Directionless, nothing was finished. We had two dead kids. I had a dissertation that wasn't done. We had gone from North Carolina to Los Angeles, the seminary, to Dallas, to D.C., back to the Raleigh area. And just dead end and frustration after dead end and frustration. And so in the midst of this, I got invited to speak at Washington Bible College. And for the first time in my life, I was getting ready to speak on something that I did not fully believe was going to come true. And First Peter, if we don't have to turn there, we'll be there in just one minute. First Peter chapter 5, verse 10, it says, And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Any builders out there, or repair, these are four verbs in the Greek, Perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish for a foundation that needs support, for a building that's out of whack that needs to be brought up right. After you suffer for a little while, God himself is going to do this. This is not going to be a change of lot. This is not just going to be circumstances just kind of on their own. God himself is going to do this. Hurricane Fran had come over uh, North Carolina and just done massive damage. And we had survived that hurricane. And so I thought about I'm going to do 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10 for my sermon in, that I had been invited to preach at Washington Bible College. Now, I would have no trouble at all if I had known you at that time to say, you hang in there, God really will perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. What I did was that I got to the point that I did not believe. I didn't, I, I didn't, want, to, I didn't want to die so much, but I didn't want to live either. I had no idea why God had allowed me to learn what I learned and have just closed door upon closed door upon closed door. 
if you had told me at the time that I was going to be with John MacArthur as the president of the seminary that I would be teaching, I would just say, hey, no way in the world. I thought God was done with me. I didn't want to play shuffleboard in Florida as part of my retirement. I, I didn't want to do. I didn't want to do anything, I, and I just didn't understand why God just kept closing door upon closing door. And so, in the midst of this, where I, was, I felt very hypocritical about preaching on something I did not fully believe, I ended up in Mark chapter ten. You don't have to turn there. We'll start our first session tomorrow with this. And in chapter ten of Mark, James and John come to Jesus as a teacher. We want you to do for us whatever it is we ask of you. And they say, and Jesus says, what is it you want me to do? And they say, we want to sit in your glory, one on your right and one on your left. And Jesus said, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? And are you able to be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? Now, beloved, my three and a half year period ended at that point. And it is not, again, so much that the three-and-a-half-year period ended, which it ended, but I came out different on the other side. And spiritually speaking, if we could see this, I think very, very clearly a sprout has sprouted out of the John 15 pruning part. I, mean, I, I could not. I came out of there, and it's in, in no kind of relation to anybody else other than myself but again, it wasn't so much that the three and a half year period ended as much as I came out different on the other side. And I could, I came out as though I, God took me on this little elevator. And again, not in reference to you or anyone else or not that I'm on the highest elevator ever. But he just kind of brought me up here and said, okay, out you go. Tell me what you see. It was, I couldn't think fast enough. I wrote the cup chapter that we'll do tomorrow. I wrote that pretty much at one sitting straight through. And I preached it at Washington Bible College, and they had 200, 300 there. I don't know exactly the number. And when I did the chapter that we'll do tomorrow, it was dead silent afterwards. And people got up, and they walked out without saying anything. And I had never seen that before. And I remembered thinking, this is real something, <laughs> This is real good, or it's real bad, but it's not marginal. It's not, it's not in between. And so I studied the glory of God. I honestly don't study suffering. From time to time, I got introduced that way. This is Dr. Greg Harris. He studies suffering. And I'll very kindly say, you know, say, I'm Dr. Greg Harris, and I study the glory of God. Now, it was suffering that led me into the study of the glory of God. In fact, if you have your Bibles... 1 Peter chapter 5, just a few of verses with this. This is where I started, and we're going to work our way through the sheet with this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Now, this sal as to the salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful search and inquiry, in verse 11, seeking to know what person the time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ, and the glories that follow. And it's always going to be this order. It's going to be the suffering first and the glories that follow. And it's plural in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. It was sufferings, plural, for Christ. It will be for us as well. It was glories, plural, for Christ. It will be for us as well. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, so you've got suffering and glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore I exhort the elder among you as fellow elder, your fellow elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that's to be revealed. And here's our fourth verse, the one I started with, chapter 5, verse 10, And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself 
perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. This is not going to be a change of luck. This is going to be God actively working. That doesn't mean that you get your twins back if they die. It doesn't necessarily mean you get your legs back if you're crippled. But it does mean that God has something in mind. This is what we'll see, that if you're a Christian, everybody's going to suffer to some degree. If you live long enough, you are going to suffer. If you live long enough, people that you know are going to die. If you live long enough, you won't believe this, some of you, you are going to age. The older people have no qualms believing this. The young bucks and buckets are the ones that have, they have to live by faith with this, that I won't really get there, but kind of read Genesis 3 and you'll, you'll kind of see where you're headed with this. Now, beloved, before we do the sheet, I, I do want to back up and say one thing with this, that when God cut on the lights, or what, I don't even know what the proper term, when the, when the wilderness part, didn't even know it was called the wilderness at the time. When that part ended, and my mind kind of flooded with scripture, I placed my hand over my mouth, and I didn't talk to God for two days. And I didn't, it was, it was the type of not talking to God in a reverent way. This was not defiant, this was Job at the end of the book of Job where I placed my hand over my mouth and at the end of two days I told God that if this is what it takes for you to accomplish your will in my life then put me back in line. If it's another three and a half years, if it's another 30 years then put me back in line because you are worthy. My circumstances didn't change. Not for a while my circumstances didn't. But I tell you what, it was spiritual chiropractic, and God was very, very patient in getting the head and the heart screwed on straight together. Now, he ended up writing, as you have seen, The Cup and the Glory. I didn't know that I was going to end up writing a book. I was an English lit major when I was in college, and I thought everybody enjoyed writing, Hannah. I thought everybody did, until I married my wife. Ed, who did not enjoy it. She's better at it now. She was an English lit major as well. But she would just have a hard time. We'd go out to eat with people and she'd write a little thank you note and she was, I don't know what to say. And I said, well, what would you say if you were here in person? I said, I'd like to say thank you for having us over. We had a wonderful time. And I said, well, how about this? Thank you for having us over. We had a wonderful time. <laughs> and she said, that's easy for you. <laughs> and so... I just, I wrote because I enjoyed, I enjoyed writing. So when I wrote The Cup and the Glory, I wrote The Cup chapter. That was the first one. I wrote it for myself. didn't have any idea it was going to be published. When finally I would start turning into publishers, they would say, who did you write this for? And I would answer the question. I would type in my name, G-R-E-G-H-A-R-R-I. I wrote it for Greg Harris. And I was the only one, I was telling Franz earlier today, that when I wrote this, I didn't have anybody really to interact with, that somebody that either wasn't a relative or a close friend that would read this. And so when they responded to it, I didn't trust their response. I didn't trust what they were saying because they just thought they're too closely attached to this. But I end up, again, studying the glory of God. This is what we are going to do. Suffering was kind of the tunnel that God had me go through in order to study his, his glory. Now we have the sheets that Franz has so masterly passed out to you with his gift of ushering. And so just to look at these, just a few presuppositions. This is setting the table for where we're headed tomorrow with this. And so you've got almost a thousand references to the glory of God. It's hard to tell exactly how many because you can have a reference to the glory of God. You can have one reference, like for instance, Psalm 19.1, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. That's the only time that the glory of God, word, the words glory of God shows up in that psalm, yet the whole psalm is about declaring the glory of God. And so it's hard to tell exactly. You've got in the neighborhood 600, 700, 800, up to 1,000 verses on the glory of God. Now, if you were like me, I didn't know anything in the world about the glory of God other than it's in songs and we sing about different times or you know, part of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, you've got an aspect of that in there. 
But for this, the glory of God, just to begin with, is much, much more vast than we can comprehend. Now, I don't know if y'all call it this or you, if you have this song over, over here. You know, a lot of times in America, in the Christian world, we diminish God's glory by just how we refer to this. And so, for instance, in America, there's a song, it's called the Battle Hymn of the Republic. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Do y'all have that here? What do y'all call it? Glandular fever or something else? <laughs> you call it something else? Do y'all call it, y'all don't call it the Battle Hymn of the Republic, though, do you? That's what they call it in North, that's what was the song, it was a Civil War song. So my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Really? Your eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord? Yeah. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon not give us light. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heaven be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man shall appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth shall mourn when they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Your eyes have seen that? Yeah. Really? It's well intended. It was a Civil War song. It was written after a battle. And I don't have any kind of base of comparison. I didn't go through the military. I don't know what it was like to be with a Civil War battle and all the carnage that would take place. But beloved, I promise you this, well intended, but it's not, your eyes have not seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Now we used to sing a song, I don't know if y'all seen that as well. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. Do y'all know that song? Some of you don't. All right, here comes a line. I can hear the rush of angel wings. Really? I can hear the rush of angel wings. Yeah. That's just a bad case of winter itch. I can hear the rush of angel wings. And then the next line is, I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And that is well intended. And this is not a cut or an insult. But this is not biblically true. Now I'm 58 going on 80-something, hip replacement and all. I'm 58 going on 80-something. And when I looked in the mirror, when I shaved this morning, which I did shave since I was coming here tonight, I did not see the glory of the Lord upon my face. I saw a 58-year-old man that has been through 58 years of this earth. Now, I don't know if this is going to diminish the reality of some of you or stretch the reality of some of you, but when I look out, I don't see the glory of the Lord <laughs> on your face <laughs> as well. Now, again, it's well intended when they say, I see glory on each face. It's well intended. It's just not biblically accurate. Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him up to a mountain. He began to pray, and as he was praying, his face was transfigured before them when they saw the glory of the Lord on the face of Jesus. And so a lot of times we diminish God's glory just by things that, you know, are not really biblically accurate. But I'll tell you something else, too. When I was in Maryland, I got taken to uh, uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center. It was down the road from the church that I pastored. It was part of NASA. Are you all familiar with NASA, our space program that we used to have anyway? Uh, but Goddard Space Flight Center was one of the NASA centers, just a few miles down the road from the church that I pastored, and we had NASA engineers in there, and um, one of the guys there had his own satellite at the Smithsonian Institute. Now, are we familiar with the Smithsonian? Do y'all know about that? The, there's a real famous museum in America. God could not trust me with having a, my own satellite at the Smithsonian Institute. I would tell everybody I knew that I had a satellite in the Smithsonian. So one of our guys at church had a satellite. We had spies at our church and mad scientists. It was an interesting breed of people that we had. But the guy that had his satellite at the Smithsonian was a high-ranking NASA scientist. 
And he took me to uh, he took me to eat there one day and kind of gave me a VIP tour, not because I was a VIP, but because he was a VIP tour. I looked like I stepped inside a Far Side cartoon. I don't know if y'all know about y'all know about Far Side. <laughs> I looked like I stepped just all these scientists around wearing white coats and such. But he he took me around there and he showed me and he said, "We guess guesstimate because they don't know." that our solar system has in the neighborhood of 200 billion, give or take, our galaxy has 200 billion stars. We can't tell you exactly how many stars we have in our galaxy. When God took Abram out in Genesis 15 and said, count the stars if you are able, God had a pretty good idea that Abram was not going to be able. Now, I don't know what 200 billion anything is. I don't have a, any kind of conception that I can say, oh, that's what 200 billion is. Now, they, and I told Bob, Dr. Langle, I told Bob that if I'm listening to something that they're saying in my mouth, you look over and you see that my mouth has dropped open, would you just kind of kindly, gently reach over and close my mouth? If I'm standing there in amazement, because they said, they guesstimate that we have in the neighborhood of 200 billion galaxies. With each of the 200 billion galaxies having, give or take, 200 billion stars each. And you know what Psalm 19.1 says? The heavens are declaring the glory of God. The heavens do not contain the glory of God. The glory of God contains the heavens. And so that's when I say to begin with that the glory of God is just vastly bigger than we can have any kind of mental comprehension on there. And so that's just a few presuppositions. That's, that's presupposition number one. Now you're welcome to follow the verses along there that are listed or you're welcome to listen. The presupposition number two, God's glory, though currently veiled and not fully disclosed, extends to every place God is, and there's one exception. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, you can listen to this or turn there. There's one place where God's glory is not. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, it talks about people that will be in hell, and these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 9. So God's glory extends to everywhere that God is and there is one exception. Hell is not going to have any kind of display of the glory of God. Part of what makes heaven heaven is the presence of God and the glory of God. Part of what makes hell hell, God is still going to be present. When you go to Revelation 14, you'll find that those in hell are going to be punished in the presence of the Lamb and of the angels. So God is going to be there. But he's going to remove any kind of evidence of his glory. And it's interesting. There's, you don't have to know this, but the Greek word hetamazo is used. It doesn't say that God created hell. It says it was hell was prepared. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, you don't have to turn there. You can just note that if you want to. It says that hell was originally hetamazo, prepared for the devil and his angels. Part of the preparation that God did, he removed aspects of his glory, and the end result was hell. It's not so much like let there be darkness, let there be flame. He removes the aspect of his glory, and these are part of the byproducts with this. And just for the record, heaven is, has the same word, hetamazo. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many, med many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to hetamazo, prepare a place for you. And so heaven is prepared for the saved, and hell was prepared originally for the devil and his angels. And so while the heavens are declaring the glory of God, there's one place that God decided in all of his creations, wherever many of those are, I'm going to remove any kind of evidence of my glory, and that end result is going to be hell. Now the third presupposition for this 
not only is God's glory vastly bigger than our comprehension, and God's glory is everywhere with one exception, and that exception is hell. God destines believers to glory. It says in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, you can listen or turn there, either one. But we do see him who has been made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Verse 10, for it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through suffering. So from the time that you became saved, if you are saved, from the time you became saved, you started a trek that is going to end up in the glory of God. In fact, his presence end up with that. And to me, one of the most amazing verses in all the Bible, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, you can listen or turn there. These are incredible, utterly incredible verses. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, we should always give thanks to you. To God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Listen to 2 Thessalonians 2.14, or you follow along, whichever you like. And it was for this that he called you through our gospel. Don't you love verses like that? You ever wonder why he called us through his gospel? 2 Thessalonians 2.14, that you may gain the glory of of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is utterly staggering. If we had written that, that would be blasphemy. He's called you for this purpose, that you may receive the glory of God. And there are different degrees to this. There are different elements of reward, different levels of reward. Everybody's going to receive some glory. It's interesting, there's no definite article in the Greek. Most of the English translations put the the in front of it. You're not going to receive the full glory of Jesus because he would be kind of worshiping you and this isn't going to happen. But we are going to receive some of his glory which we deserve none of whatsoever. I tell you, it changes. Let's do one more and we'll start winding down. Now, God's in the process, number four, of currently or presently developing glory in his believers, for those who are his children. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, a verse that is familiar to many of you, for I consider, I reckon, I write this down as a fact, that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is yet to be revealed to us. Romans 8.18 8, That the sufferings of this present time are in no way... It's interesting, it's a Greek word, axios. You don't have to know that necessarily, but axios, when you've got these scales, and they use them in third world countries. You've got two different parts, a fulcrum in the middle, you put bananas on one side, you put stones on another. When you put enough bananas to move this, or put enough stones to make this, when the scales are axios, when they line up, they are worthy. And Paul says, I consider that the sufferings, plural, of this present time are not axios worthy. They don't match each other with the glory that's yet to be revealed. And so God's in the process of doing this in our lives now. It's not just something in the future. Now, he is going to bring many sons to glory. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, again, you can listen or turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, Therefore, though we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, listen to this. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. And so this is what is happening now. Now, this is not automatic. This means you have to be saved. This means you have to be walking with God. 
Now, when I look back at my three and a half year period that they ended up naming the wilderness, when I look back at that, I thought God was doing nothing. And actually what he was doing biblically, if I respond properly, is that he is producing an eternal, not temporary, an eternal weight of glory vastly beyond all comparison. There's nothing that we can compare it to. And so this happens if you, not just if you suffer, you have to walk with God. Unbelievers suffer. Unbelievers have kids to die. Unbelievers end up with diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis. But if you're walking with God and he allows this suffering into your life, then it is for a purpose. It is something that he wants to produce that he could not produce otherwise. And so the glory of God is vaster than we can comprehend, right? The heavens are declaring the glory of God. God's glory extends to everywhere God is with one exception. Second Thessalonians 1 9, hell does not have any kind of demonstration of the glory of God. The glory is our home ultimately in bringing many sons to glory, Hebrews 2. And also with this, he's in the process of developing glory in our lives if we walk with him. I said, how's this for a request from James to John? Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever it is we ask of you. What is it that you want me to do? We want to sit in your glory. One on your right, one on your left. You do not know what you are asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism? Now that's where we pick up tomorrow with us. And we're going to pick up with a request of James and John to Jesus. We're going to backtrack a little bit in scripture. We're going to tie this together. But tomorrow, in essence, is where I started with us, with the cup chapter. And so I wrote these things. Uh, again, I didn't know this was going to be a book. I just wrote it for myself and wrote it because I enjoyed writing. And kind of a book came out of it. And I'll tell you more about that. Do we make progress? Hey, you think? Do you want me to close in prayer or sing? Or what would you like for me to just pray for us? Dear Lord, thank you for so great a salvation. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for the hundreds of verses that have your glory in it. Thank you that momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory vastly beyond all comparison. Thank you that the sufferings of this present time are in no way axios worthy with the glory yet to be revealed. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. We pray for the rest of the conference as we study your word that we will come away changed because we have been near to you. So bless this, dear Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.